celebrations and displays at every turn, whether it's you're walking through the mall and you see a Pride Month display there, or driving through your city and see a, a Pride celebration going on or somewhere else. This is a conversation that parents are having to have with their kids this month uh, as, as you're encountering these different um, these different celebrations and uh, observations of Pride Month. Um, so I think it's a question that everyone's asking is how should we talk with our kids about sex, about gender, about Pride Month? Um, I'm Meridian Baldacci. I'm the Director of Strategy at Family Policy Alliance. And uh, we are so excited that you are here with us today to talk about this topic. Um, if you're watching, be sure to share, like, comment on this. The social media companies don't like us, so the only way we can get our message out is if you if you actually share uh, for us and help us get that message out there. Uh, but today, to talk about this topic, I am joined by two wonderful guests, uh, Grace Evans uh, with Minnesota Family Council. Minnesota Family Council is one of our state allies, and they're doing just wonderful work um, in the state of Minnesota to protect families and children. And then um, FPA's own Autumn Leva joins us. Um, she is our Senior Vice President of Strategy. Um, and I know the two of them are going to just share with us some, some wonderful dialogue. Autumn is actually a mom herself. Um, and Grace actually works with teens uh, and talks with them about these topics. So I kind of want to start off with the basics with you both. What is something, I, I, th I think parents can wonder themselves, why do we as Christians disagree with the LGBT agenda? What is our issue with, with the Pride Month celebrations? Um, maybe I'll start, start with you, Autumn, but I'd love to hear from both of you. Well, I think that's a great question and one that as parents and as, as people who work in this space, we have to be able to answer because our kids gonna are going to ask us, like you said, Meridian, it's everywhere. Um, and so I know for myself, something that my husband and I have talked about is that the reason this is a problem and the reason that displaying the pride flag and businesses falling all over themselves like Target and Bud Light to display the pride flag, the reason all of that is a problem is because it's marketing an ideology that that's really founded on lies and not just, you know, a, a little white lie that we know is wrong, but it's sort of harmless, um, but really da damaging lies that can destroy lives, destroy families. Um, like, for example, telling a child that they were born in the wrong body and that they have to change everything about themselves from the way they look, the way they act, even removing healthy body parts and taking experimental drugs just to become who they truly are. Um, that is very, very damaging. And I think that as, as believers and as parents who are trying to instill those values in our kids, uh, we have to be ready to call it what it is, say that this is built on lies um, and, and understand and help our kids understand that the only real truth and the only real identity and hope that we have is in Christ Jesus alone. Um, so that's something where I, I don't think there's a compromise. We just have to stand firm on that with our kids. Absolutely. Anything you want to add to that, Grace? Yeah, you know, I think that's a really great uh, answer there, Autumn. I Something I often say, too, is, you know, okay, so why do we disagree with this agenda as Christians specifically? And there goes my light. Um, and I would say it's as simple as this. It's actually because we love LGBT people. It's as simple as that. We love them, and therefore we have to disagree with the agenda. Um, it's God is love. We know that as Christians, and we know that if God is love, if he is love, then we know that we, as that which he has created, just we can't ever out love God. And so oftentimes, many of us love and fear our friends and our family and our coworkers more than we love and we fear God. And we're more afraid of becoming enemies with prominent people in culture, with our friends, with our families, than becoming enemies with God. And it's actually not loving to lie to LGBTQ plus people. It's not loving to encourage people to commit sexual sins. It's not loving to encourage people to reject who God made them to be. Uh, God created us male and female because he loves us. And because we love LGBT people, we must tell them the truth. And so if we want to love them, we need to tell them the truth about the way God made the world and the truth about gender and sexuality, the truth about marriage. And so we just need to be crystal clear on that, that we actually oppose this agenda because we love people and we want what's best for them. I love what you said that we can't out love God, you know, that God loves, loves everyone so much more than we ever could. 
Um, and so when we're, we're living within his design and, and encouraging others to live also within his design, that is a loving thing to do. And we can, we can like, we can trust that God is going to leave, uh, is going to love others better than, than we even can. Um, Autumn, speaking of loving people, obviously as a mom, you're wanting to do the most loving, caring thing for your daughters. Um, and you're, you're a mom to little kids, but you're probably thinking through already, what are kind of the, some of the situations? What are some of the questions um, that, that you're thinking through on talking with them about pride, about LGBT, about sex and gender issues? Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, first of all, I have to say that that's so true. What Grace was describing, because I think oftentimes love today is equated with tolerance when that's not mm -hmm. the case at all. True, true love and what love really looks like is a person. And that's that's God and, and the love that he gave us through his son, Jesus. So I think that's exactly right. Love is not the same as tolerance. And we do have to speak the truth if we actually love someone. Um, and so that is a value that I'm trying to instill in my girls. They're only three in one. So I think right now, Meridian, the question that I'm asking is, how do I actually protect my daughters from this, this content? Because highly sexualized content of any kind is not appropriate for young children. Um, and I've, you know, I've encountered it at the library. I've encountered it um, in, out in, in culture and in where we walk by down the street, like you were saying earlier. And so my, my purpose right now as their parent, as their mother who loves them, is to protect them and make sure that their exposure to sexualized content uh, is is minimal at at bet or at worst and not at all at best because it's just not appropriate for children of that age and I know like for example in the state of Florida that's something that they worked on with Governor DeSantis's leadership last year was ensuring that that type of content wasn't in the classroom for young children so I think that is that is the right call for very young children um, but as they get older that will shift. And my, my question will be, how do I actually equip them to stand strong in the face of this constant ideology, ideological and political onslaught? How do I equip them to be confident in who they are and be confident in their identity in Christ and that they were fearfully and wonderfully made as, as girls, that God designed them that way? Um, and be able to speak the truth and love to those around them, because I want them to be loving to their neighbors, including their neighbors who, as, as Grace said, identify as LGBT. Absolutely. Grace, I, I know you're, you're not a parent, but you are someone who grew up with a Christian worldview. Um, you, uh, obviously, your parents helped you tackle some of these, these situations. What were some of the ways that your parents talked about these issues with you? Yeah, that's a great question. And it really is just crazy how much has changed in the past 10 years. I mean, I'm 20, I'm 22. And when I was growing up, the agenda was not nearly as prevalent as it is today. I've just seen things got, get so much more prevalent, even in the past, I would say five years, but even 10 years. Um, and so I mean, the ba the baseline thing that they did was just model a marriage between one man and one woman really well. And I think when you see that in a home, that has a great impact on you as a child. But another thing was I wasn't exposed to LGBTQ agenda unwittingly. So when we did see it, it was with my parents present and we were taught how to react to it and how to dismantle it. So uh, I would say even now, it's so much more common in TV shows and in movies. I mean, you can hardly watch any Disney movies without having a gay character or the two moms come in somehow in every single show now, it seems like. And so now it's so much more common. But whenever we did see it in movies or in culture, we knew how to respond to it. We uh, were taught that loving, like Autumn was saying, loving someone doesn't mean agreeing with their choices. And we were taught the difference between biblical love and tolerance, which is what the world sees as love. And so I was well, taught. What would that like, look, look like in practice? I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, your parents are you're, they're watching that movie with you. Do they do they at the end of the movie say, let's talk about what we saw or how does that how does that work in practice? Mm -hmm. That was very common. So we'd watch something, whether it's I mean, we liked growing up, we liked Doctor Who and Sherlock and such. Um, those didn't really have many of those themes. But if there was a movie, um, honestly, with any movie, they would say, what, what themes did you see in it? What things can we affirm? What things do we disagree with? And so that was really helpful with anything, not just with this ideology. Um, and so we give our response. And I think that was a really helpful, really helpful thing for me as a kid growing up. Um, 
another thing is I was thrown into the fight pretty from a pretty young age. Autumn knows this. When we were here in both here in Minnesota working for Minnesota Family Council, I as a volunteer and her as staff, we faced um, basically same-sex marriage being on the ballot. Um, they were trying to redefine gender and sexuality and say that it's okay for two women to get married and two men to get married. And at that time, I was 11 years old. And this is before Obergefell, the, before the Obergefell decision. And so I was thrown into that as a testifier, as a young child testifier. And so I testified in favor of God's design for family and marriage and talked about what it meant to me as a kid to have a mom and a dad and how important that is for every child because every child deserves a mom and a dad. And so I think that really also helps solidify, not that every child has to testify or has the opportunity to testify in front of representatives um, or at their state capitol, but I think that also helped to solidify why I believed what I believe. I was able to write out a testimony of why I thought it was important for every child to have a mom and a dad. And so I think those conversations, um, just making sure you're having those conversations with your parents were very formative for me. Well, and now you actually talk about those issues with teens. I know that MFC has a great um, camp, which I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that as well. But um, if you could share about that camp, but then also how you talk about these with teens, because I think that's, may like Autumn was saying, that's maybe where parents struggle the most is when they're little, they're, it's about protecting kids. And I want to talk more about that in a, in a minute here. But as kids get older, it becomes about actually having conversations about these topics. And so um, when you're talking with teens, how do you approach that? Yeah, so I either do that through different speaking events, which I've done across the state, but I also speak with them through that camp that you mentioned, which is called LEAD, and it is a week-long summer experience for teens, and that has been great. Basically, we help them solidify a Christian worldview and then apply it to the public sphere, and so then they are um, going out and learning how the political process works, learning how bills work, and they are separated into caucuses, and they kind of have a real-life simulation. And so it's a leadership camp designed to help the next generation step into culture and lead our culture. And so, of course, gender is one of the main topics, as is abortion. And so I would say that when I talk with teens and older kids about this issue, one of the main things that I often do is I encourage them to refuse to compromise on the seemingly small things because it was, this, it was the compromising on the small things, quote unquote, that got us to where we are now. So let's just take Obergefell, for example, when people began to compromise on marriage, that actually led to what we see now, which is people transitioning to be a different gender, which harms, harms people's bodies irreversibly. And so one example of the things that I refuse, I tell them, refuse to compromise on this, it's pronouns. And I know it's controversial, um, it's very controversial in today's culture, but really, and I see so many of my peers using pronouns in social media bios and LinkedIn bios, and even if you use your biologically correct pronoun in your bio, that's still buying into a false narrative that you can change your pronoun, that you can change your gender. And so it's just not true. It's buying into a false ideology that is actually very dangerous. And so I encourage them to use biologically correct pronouns, to not put their pronouns in their bios. Um, so that's one of the things. The other thing I often tell teens is to remember to combat the deceptive language. So deceptive language such as love is love, um, which by that logic, that logic is just so misleading. I mean, that basically is the argument that they always use of there's nothing wrong with a man loving a man because love is love. And why that's so dangerous is, well, if that's the case, then what's wrong with pedophilia, for instance? And I know that's grotesque and it it's shocking to some people, but it's the truth. That is the natural outcome of this logic. If it's okay for men to marry men and love men, then what's wrong with an adult uh, loving children? And so that's the natural outflow. So combating the deceptive language, like love is love, like the there's often this one-liner floating around that gender reassignment surgery is, quote, making people whole. And it's actually the opposite of what it does. No, that actually hurts children. Uh, it sterilizes, it mutilates children, it makes it so that they can't ever have children in the future. It chops off uh, healthy body parts that hurts children, it does not help them. And you guys have a great campaign called Help Not Harm, I love that. Another thing I talk to students about is parental rights versus children's rights. There's really a false dichotomy floating around right now that um, puts parental rights and children's rights in direct competition against one another, which is kind of similar to what how men do well and then women don't like men and women are kind of in that same 
combative nature right now somehow. Um, but contrary to the claims of the progressive people out there, we actually as Christians are for the children. We are for the children living. We are for them not being mutilated. And we see parental rights, parental parents as having a, a huge role in that. I mean, parents want what's best for their children. Uh, and so parents have a great place in children's lives. And there's a reason why children can't consent to certain things. It's because we love and protect them. And because they're not old enough to consent to things, kids can't consent to getting tattoos. Um, they can't vote at a certain age. There are things kids can't do because we love them. And so kids also shouldn't have to undergo, they should not have the option of undergoing gender reassignment surgery. And that's why parents are there to step in. And so I think those are the main things that I talk to kids about, talk to teens about. Um, and I also talk to them about what I call the five A's that the movement demands you to comply with. And so if you falter at any point, you're seen, seen as a hater. The first one is acceptance. They want you to accept transgender people and respect their pronouns, their lifestyle. And the second one is affirmation. They not only want you to accept them, they want you to affirm. They want you to, to say, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and then they want you to step into alliance with them, which is the moving to their side. And then they want you to do the advocacy for them, which is encouraging their lifestyle, confusion, child mutilation, denying the truth. And then they want you to advance that. They want you to go out in the workplace and advance that through activism um, and do the work yourself. And so I just encourage kids, encourage teens on all of those points. Well, and I love that you walked through the, the kind of steps that people walk through because um, I, I think that's so important, especially with teens. Uh, teens of any age who lived in any time uh, always feel, I think, a, a level of social pressure to want want to conform, to want to affirm, to not to to want to not be different, um, at least in some ways. Um, and so, I, I think it's very easy um, for anyone in, in our day and age, but especially for teens, to say, you know what, I'm just I'm just affirming my friend. I'm just not being the the odd one out. Um, and so walking through saying this is this is actually where this leads and this is actually not the most loving thing. We actually want to be for children. I love I love all of that. Um, I, I want to turn to you, Autumn, because you talked a little bit about protecting your kids. You know, we've been talking about what do you say um, when you're talking with older kids. But when we're talking about little kids, um, when you're walking through, I, I'll throw I'll throw two different scenarios at you. Um, the first one is you're, you're walking through a store and you see signs and maybe your little, little girl will ask, you know, mommy, what's that about? Um, how are you thinking through that kind of situation? Well, first of all, Meridian, I have to say that I, I have known Grace since she was about nine and she's always been that articulate. So her par parents did a wonderful <laughs> job of teaching her on, on how to articulate her worldview and really champion that and show grace and truth in love. Um, so I, I, I just applaud that. I think it's great to see where she's come from and how she's now teaching others the same thing that her parents taught her. That's amazing. Um, as for me, Meridian, that scenario that you described, that has definitely already happened. My three-year-old is very observant. And, you know, what? what's wonderful about this is that as we're walking around, she knows that the rainbow is a sign of God's promise and his promise to us. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when she sees a rainbow, that's her, her only thought. She says, look, mommy, it's so beautiful. The rainbow is God's promise. And I, at this point, what I have done with her is say, you're exactly right. The rainbow is exactly intended to be God's promise, uh, because that's what I want her to associate the rainbow with. And I want her to remember what God has promised to us with that rainbow. Now, of course, as we've already said, as she gets older, as my, my younger one, who's only one gets older we will be having a different conversation. We will be talking about how the rainbow is being used to spread a false ideology, to spread lies that are harmful and dangerous. And that if we do love someone, that we have to stand up and say, no, this is wrong. This is harmful. Telling a child that you were born in the wrong body, that's harmful. It leads to all those things that Grace described, mutilating a child's body, pumping them full of fal false hormones and experimental hormones that do leave, leave them sterile or leave them um, in some in some cases, like with a, a 
detransitioner who we've worked with named Chloe Cole. Many of many of you watching have probably heard of her. She shares how she's not able to nurse her own children if she wants to have any or it's even able to have any in the future now because of the surgery that she underwent buying into this false lie that was peddled to her as a young child. Um, so we have to be able to stand strong. And if we do love someone, we're, we have to be able to help point them towards the truth, help point them towards the light, and that they don't have to um, buy into something that's going to cause them harm down the road. So the conversation does shift as, as the kids get older. But for now, I'm very content with my daughter knowing that the rainbow is a sign of God's promise only. And I like that that's, that's where you're going with, with someone, with a child that young, you know, there's, there's only a so much level of comprehension. You, you can't, you can't go too far. And this is actually the argument that, that we make too, right? Is when, when we're talking about things like what Florida did, um, is that it's not appropriate for kids kindergarten through third grade to be having these very detailed conversations about LGBT ideology. You know, every parent's going to make the make the decision at what point along there, maybe they do have a conversation with their child, but it's certainly not appropriate for the schools to be indoctrinating kids um, into this ideology that young. So I love hearing that you're affirming what's right and true um, with your three-year-old daughter. Let me throw one more scenario at you and, and you, you, both, Grace, you can feel free to jump in on this too. Um, one big area we've seen this agenda showing up and I'm sure it's going to be even more the case this month is in schools and libraries. Um, so whether it's with uh, library drag queen shows or um, just other uh, book displays. We see this a lot at schools and libraries. Um, how can parents protect their kids in those environments? I'll toss it to you first, Autumn, but Grace, feel free to chime in. <laughs> Meridian, I feel like I'm back in law school because they always throw you hypotheticals in law school. <laughs> Be prepared to answer. Um, no, that's a great question because it does happen. And I'm sure that parents are encountering that. We hear from parents every week who have encountered this in their library, certainly at the school. Um, so one thing I'll share is at libraries and just in culture generally with my kiddos, because they are so young, I'm screening everything. I'm screening the books that they might pick out at the library. I'm screening movies before they would watch them, any kind of app um, or what they're watching on, on YouTube. Obviously, it's, it's not all innocent. And sometimes it can even show up unintentionally, right? So a book at a library or even at a school, even if your child is going to a faith-based school, the person who has purchased the book for the school may not even realize what the content of that book is. Um, and the titles sometimes sound innocent. So it's important as parents, I know we're all busy, believe me, I know, uh, but it is important to screen that material. So that's, that's one recommendation that I have just at a very, very practical level. Um, one thought I have for libraries, if you're encountering that at a library, which I have, I can tell you, I was helping my three-year-old and my one-year-old pick out books and my one-year-old had a board book that was basically erasing the gender binary. If that wasn't the name of it, but that was the theme for, for a board book. So for kiddos who are, you know, two and under. Um, so of course, what you can do in that scenario is you can bring it to the library. You can raise a complaint, raise a concern, flag it for them. Um, some libraries, honestly, they may not care, but what you can do from that point is find out who runs that library, Is who, who funds it. Is it publicly funded at all? Because if so, that they are accountable to tax, taxpayers for how they're using their public, public monies. And if they're promoting um, LGBT ideology, then they are accountable to taxpayers for that. And you can take action through that way. Um, so finding out how they're funded and who governs them is important so that you can decide as a parent how you can take action and who you can contact about the concern. Um, and certainly you can take your business elsewhere, so to speak, and not, uh, not bring your kids to that library. If it's at schools, obviously that's, that's a bit of a different scenario, certainly more concerning. Hopefully parents are in a situation where they can choose a school or an education program that's best for them and their children and matches with their values. Um, but I know that's not an option for every parent. So at Family Policy Alliance, we partnered with Focus on the Family to create something called Back to School for Parents. It's available at FamilyPolicyAlliance.com for download. Um, it's a huge, long, long uh, article, long reading material. Um, so I, I would recommend that you take it in chunks, but it walks through how a, a parent can protect their child and understand their rights as a parent and their responsibilities as a parent in different areas of the school. So what are your rights and what should you be concerned about in your child's curriculum and classroom or on the sports field or in the locker room, even on school databases or technology or in the library? 
Um, so it's a very helpful tool. We encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, but the, the best power that you have as a parent is knowing what's going on and being informed about your child. Um, and Meridian, I guess the final point I'll make on that is one that's, of course, concerning. And the whole reason that Florida had to pass their bill last year is because some schools have been hiding that information from parents. But you do have a federal right to access your child's information at your child's public school. So we can encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, and some states like yours, Grace, in Minnesota, I know they have a statewide law that allows parents access and transparency into curriculum. Um, so being sure to know what your laws are in your specific state, what your rights are, all of that can help you as a parent be, be equipped to either protect your child from the content if they're young, like my kiddos, or um, be able to equip them and have the right conversations with them, like what Grace's uh, parents did with her. Um, all of those tools are very important. Absolutely. Anything you want to add to that, Grace? Yeah, I think that screening is so important. I would also say that um, kind of on the note of what Adam was mentioning about, okay, sometimes schools will try to hide curriculum from parents, and also sometimes they will fail to report to parents if a child is going by a different gender identity at school than they are at home. Sometimes they won't report that to parents. And if either of those things are happening at your school, one, yes, report it. But then secondly, I think it's time for you to find a new school because I don't think that your kids should be going to a school like that. Um, they shouldn't be on the front lines of the battle when they're not even yet able to hold a sword, so to speak. Um, so pull your kids from those schools, I would advise if that is the case and get loud about it because parental rights matter and you absolutely need to know what your kids are being taught and you pay good money for your kids' education. So those are my thoughts there. Yeah, and if you wanna hear more about uh, what can happen if a school doesn't tell a parent, uh, we actually had a conversation with another one of our state allies in Virginia mm -hmm. Um, it's a conversation about Sage's Law, and we'll link that up here in the comments um, that you can watch and hear. Really a tragic story about what can happen there, but also how uh, in Virginia, the Family Policy Council there is fighting back, which makes me I actually want to just remind you all, if you're watching, if you are not involved with your state's Family Policy Council, please do get involved. Uh, we have a wonderful network of about 40 state uh, Family Policy Councils. So they are groups that are fighting on the front lines in your state um, on all, all the issues that we're talking about here today, as well as often issues on life and education, religious freedom. Um, they are fighting for, for you and all of that. Um, and we are honored to be able to host their alliance. So uh, be sure to, to check that out. If you're in Minnesota, get involved with MFC. Um, if you're not in Minnesota, you can take a look at the link and find your FPC. Um, I have one final question to you both, and then we'll wrap this up here. Do you have any general encouragement for parents in this area, um, especially here in Pride Month? Well, I'll just share, I think, um, some, something that someone told me once, and I, I was so encouraged by it, and it was that, remember, that you were chosen by God to be the parent for your child. And yes, that comes with a huge weight of responsibility, and especially in today's world, as we've been talking about throughout this whole episode. But but that God has given them to you for a reason and that he will equip you to be the parent that they need, who can be the protector and the advocate um, and the person who will train them to handle these issues in the world with grace and truth and love, real love, not, not the false love that we hear so often from the other side. So just remember, you are the one who is called to be your child's parent. And here in our country, thank God, we are given the constitutional right as parents to guide and direct our children in their upbringing. And so you have both the, the right given by God, which is good enough, but also a constitutional right to raise your kiddos. And you were called to do that. So be encouraged that you are the right parent for your kids and you will be equipped to handle all of these situations that come, come their way. That's great. The psalmist talks about how children are like a quiver full of arrows. And I love that analogy. And um, it's our job as Christians, of course, to raise our children to be straight arrows, not to be crooked arrows, because arrows can veer off course or they can hit dead on. And we want our kids to be straight arrows. And so just that concept of we want the opposition, we want to train our kids up to be bold and courageous and just beautiful testaments to the gospel and so joyful. And we want the opposition to end up being actually afraid of our children because they are so gospel centered and so winsome and powerful. And so just, I wanted to remind you guys as parents, I'm so grateful for my parents, of course, but just to remind you that your work is not in vain, that um, being faithful in the small things really does pay off. Sometimes it's 
it's it can feel trying i'm sure that oh one more discipline again today about the same thing why do i have to keep disciplining them or why do i have to keep reminding them about this thing well it does pay off um you are training up the next generation there is no greater calling and so continue to be faithful in those things and remember like autumn said that yeah you were chosen by god to be the parent of your child and so being faithful is exactly what you're called to do and you will see the fruit of it in the coming years you will see that fruit amen well grace and autumn thank you so much for joining us today thank you if you're watching this uh for for watching again uh if you liked this if you learned from it please like comment and share uh it's the only way we can get this message out there um we hope this is an encouragement to you all the links are in in the comments uh for the different resources that we referenced um, and we know that we at FPA are uh, here and happy to support you as you think think through how to raise your kids and talk with your kids, especially in this month, but um, uh, throughout the year. And uh, we are happy to happy to engage with you in that way. So uh, with that, we'll sign off and we'll see you all next time.